The Tragedy of Cymbeline, King of Britain, is a play by William Shakespeare, set in ancient Britain 10 BC until 14 AD and based on legends that formed part of the matter of Britain concerning the early Celtic British King Cunobelin. Be fully aware, as long as literature studies deny the existence of a Shakespeare authorship problem, there will be no possibility to recognize in the figure of posthumous a definite autobiographical image of the real or true author of Cymbeline, who wrote under multiple pseudonyms, such as Shakespeare, Drayton, Chapman, Hayward, and others better known as Marlowe, as unimaginable, and unthinkable, as it can ever be. Blumenfeld in 2008 wrote, There is so much exile, banishment, disguise, mistaken identities, and dirty tricks, that one is forced to believe, that the only author who could possibly have written Cymbeline must have experienced some of all of it that is Christopher Marlowe. Harold Bloom asked himself, when discussing Cymbeline, why is the self-travesty so unrelenting? And Blumenfeld, if we simply recognize that the name Shakespeare is a cover for Marlowe, then we can go to the real source of the unrelenting self-travesty. Note with little doubt, Bloom was, unwittingly putting his finger on an autobiographic situation of posthumous in Cymbeline when he drew our attention to Act 5, Scene 4, in which posthumous, Marlowe, is put in prison, there he quotes, Most welcome, bondage. For you are away, I think, to liberty. Yet am I better than one that is sick of the gout, since he had rather grown so in perpetuity than be cured by the sure physician, death, who is the key to unbar these locks. Consider, it is well documented, that Marlowe's supervisor and boss, William Cecil, Lord Burley, suffered miserably from the gout. Posthumus then fell asleep, and had an elaborate weird dream, in which his family was sitting in a circle around him. In a poetic chant the family members describe, what has happened to him, they call for Jupiter to appear, which he does, and Jupiter predicts future happiness for Posthumus, whom best I love, I cross, to make my gift. and when from a stately cedar shall be lopped branches, which being dead many years, shall after revive, be jointed to the old stock, and freshly grow, then shall Posthumus end his miseries, Britain be fortunate, and flourish in peace and plenty. It's still a dream, or else such stuff as madman tongue, and brain not. Either both, or nothing or senseless speaking, or speaking such as sense cannot untie. b. What it is, the action of my life is like it, which I will keep, if but for sympathy. The author, posthumous, Christopher Marlowe, reflects his dream, not only as his unambiguous autobiographical life story, numbers 1 to 9, 1, his branches lop, 2, being dead many years, Three, after reviving, four five, jointed to the old stocky, six freshly growth, seven, end his miseries, eight Britain be fortunate, nine, flourish in peace, but also as the indissoluble senselessness of any dream, the action of my life. Can anyone really assume that these highly condensed autobiographical confessions, number one to nine, of posthumous correspond to biographical aspects of William from Stratford, and not perfectly to the co-eval superstar and universal genius of the London theatre, Christopher Marlowe?
let's demonstrate, even more impressively, that the Shakespeare play Cymbeline definitely portrays autobiographical contents of its author's life and destiny, that is of the true pseudonymous William Shakespeare, alias Posthumus, alias Christopher Marlowe, and by no means, of the life of William Shakespeare from Stratford reflect scene 4, in Act 5. Act 5 scene 4 sketches and unveils unmistakably the moment of Marlowe's supposed feigned death, when the jailer allegorically asks Posthumus, 1, if he is ready for death that is, if he is now well prepared, for a feigned dish or dash. Posthumus highly allegorically replies, too, rather over-roasted, ready, long ago, since he was, three, hanging, that is, his dead body was already well, prepared, well cooked, before, and will now for, prove a good repast to the spectators of the, feigned, dish or dash. We can be rather sure, that the jailer clearly reveals, in a roundabout way, the moment, when Marlowe's alleged, feigned dead body was dished up in Deptford. In reality it was the shaved head and the shaved beard of John Penry, historically documented as hanged a day prior to Marlowe's alleged killing. Be aware. In Shakespeare's play, Measure for Measure, two scenes in Act 4, Scene 2A, and B correspond precisely to the alleged scenario of Marlowe's feigned death. It discloses the moment when the false corpse of the man, called Bernardine, who was hanged a day before, very uncustomly in the late afternoon, was laid out instead of the living protagonist Claudio, and was manipulated above the eye, in order to obscure the identity of the corpse. Why, subsequently, we can be rather sure, that the jailer unveils the moment, when Marlowe's death was feigned. It's because of the reckoning in a tavern, in Deptford, near London. Read or listen to the full continuation of Scene 4 Act 5. A heavy reckoning for you, sir, but the comfort is, you shall be called to no more payments, fear no more tavern bills, which are often the sadness of parting, as the procuring of mirth, sorry, that you have paid too much, and sorry, that you are paid too much, purse and brain, both empty, the brain the heavier, for being too light, the purse too light, being drawn of heaviness. Oh, of this contradiction you shall now be quit. Oh, the charity of a penny cord, it sums up thousand in a trice, of what's past, is, and to come, the discharge, your next sir, is pen, book, and counters, so the acquittance follows. Fifteen indeed, he, that sleeps, that is dead, feels not the toothache, sixteen, but a man, that were to sleep, your sleep, meaning, it's a man, we were to think, he were the dead. Seventeen with a hangman, to help you to bed. Eighteen, I think, they would have changed places. Nineteen for you, posthumous, you know not, which way you shall go. Twenty or death has eyes in its head, note, that Marlowe was stabbed above his eyes twenty-one posthumous, must have been guided—directed by some, that took upon him, to know, twenty-two or, not to know anything. Twenty-three even though, you Marlowe will never return, to tell anyone. Can anybody really deny, that these striking highly condensed autobiographical confessions, of posthumous do not correspond to the killing episode of Marlowe in Deptford? Discovered as late as in 1925, not even 100 years ago, by Leslie Hodson. 
the fact, that Shakespeare chose the names Posthumus and Leonatus as the main characters in Cymbeline, cannot surprise nor being coincidental. The fitting construction of the name clearly indicates a deeper level of meaning. The peculiar name Posthumus suggests, that this figure represents a character who lived posthumously, that is, that led an after-life, as a new or born again, a neonatus, fitting autobiographically perfectly Marlowe, but not William from Stratford. The two-fold naming posthumous and Leonatus probably arose from the fact that Shakespeare as a pun a lion's whelp transformed the Neonatus into a Leonatus whose name suggests and explains the fortune teller at the end of the play Act 5, Scene 5. In the monologue Act One, Scene Six, the true author Shakespeare, alias Marlowe, uses the Queen to reflect his own personal biographical situation and his losses. The extent and depth of her reflections make an autobiographical background logic and plausible, without which this scene and its profound psychology can hardly be interpreted. The Queen tries to convince her daughter Imogen of the advantages of a detachment from her husband, Posthumus, whose future is dark and dubious. 1. Posthumus, Marlowe's fortunes, all lie speechless that is, he will no more be able to speak openly. 2. His name is at last Gaspé that is, he soon will breath his last breath. 3. He can never return, that is, he is, being banished, in exile. 4. He cannot continue, where he is, the former superstar of the London theatre. 5. To shift his being, would be, to exchange one misery, with another. 6. Every day that comes, comes to decay a day's work, in him. 7. What shall he expect, other than 8 to be dependent on a thing, that leans. 9. Or on things that cannot be new-built. 10. With no friends to prop him. Note, the poet's ability to reflect about himself, from the perspective of his situation of an outcast and a banished one, in a complementary way becomes obvious whose auto biographical situation, other than that of Marlowe could have been presented here. One could argue with some justification, that Cymbeline has to do more with Marlowe's state of mind at the time, than with Shakespeare. One, very similar to Hamlet, Imogen in Act 3, Scene 4, refers to false Aeneas, a clear reference to the story of Dido, one of Marlowe's early plays. 3. Imogen, posthumous wife, argues with Pisanio, posthumous servant, Marlowe's second self, if you like, that after posthumous great fail, that is, after his life catastrophe, his former virtues of grace and nobleness and of generosity shall be false and perjured. If anyone wants to catch a biographic glimpse of the true or real human being Marlowe, hiding behind the pseudonym Shakespeare, then he just has to visualize the child prodigy and poet genius called posthumous, in the first scene of the first act of Cymbeline. One. Posthumous, a poor, but worthy gentleman banished. All is outward sorrow. 2. He, a thing too bad for bad report, and he that hath her, alack, good man. 
three, and therefore banished, is a creature such as, to seek through the regions of the earth for one his like, there would be something failing in him that should compare. I do not think so fair an outward and such stuff within endows a man but he. For. I do extend him, sir, within himself, crush him together rather than unfold his measure duly. 5. So posthumus gained the sur addition Leonatus. 5a. The king, he takes the babe to his protection, calls him posthumus Leonatus, breeds him and makes him of his bedchamber, a page. 6. Puts to him all the learnings that his time could make him the receiver of, which he took, as we do air, fast as it was ministered, and in its spring became a harvest, lived in court, which rare it is to do, most praised, most loved, a sample to the youngest, to the more mature. 7. A child that guided dotids. To his mistress, for whom he now is banished, her own price proclaims how she esteemed him, and his virtue by her election may be truly read, what kind of man he is. <laughs> 